just in love with the idea of Christ being on earth with me, but I don't know, do I? None of us know how we would have been had Christ, had we been there with Christ. Because we think of our lives today and how we are still struggling, still fighting, still having that desire. But because in each one of us, there is a good and there is an evil. God has given us the, the choice. God gave man, tell me he gave no other creature a choice to choose. He wanted you to choose for yourself. Choose. Choose. And Nathan, but Jesus, the reason why Jesus cried, the reason why he was so strong was because he knew that the nation suffered, the nation would continue to suffer and suffer and suffer. Isn't that sad to hear? Isn't that sad to know that we are still at that stage? And this was A.D. 70, okay? So you know how long ago that was. The totality of the destruction is clear. Listen to this. The totality of the destruction then was clear. So know that today, even today, children will die, buildings be destroyed, even those who are in Christ, because Christ is no respecter of person. No respecter of person. Luke 19, 41 and 44, Matthew 23, 37 and 38, John 5, 40. Um, my elder, you are sitting in the back. Come on, sit in your seat right here in the front. Come on. This is your seat. Come on, elder. My elder, sit there. Sit, this is your seat. Come on, my elder, sit there. Yes, 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 yes. I, I can't I can't vision you anywhere but right there in the front. Uh-huh. Let's, let's talk more about the broken heart. Because this is, this, is, this is what we are trying very hard to tell ourselves, that his heart be mended for us, right? Okay, so we, we've read Luke chapter uh, 19, verse 41 to 44, Matthew 23, 37 and 38, and John 5, 40. What do these verses tell you about Jesus' attitude towards his people and their response to his loving invitation of grace and mercy? What do they tell you about him? What revelation of God's character do you see in those verses? We, 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 we oh, we, we, we see, and I'm a visual person, so I see things, I see those things, that Jesus wanted, but we were not willing. He still wants today, but we Unfortunately, we're still not willing. We're not willing. What what he wants for us, we do just the opposite. Do you realize that? Come on, family. I know you've read this. I know you have read the Bible from cover to cover. I know you have an understanding of some of the words. I know you. I know you know where you are. I know you know where you want to go. <laughs> so what we're here is to prepare ourselves for a better road. Okay? A better road. I wanted to gather you, you, your children together, is what Christ said. He wanted to gather his children. We are his children. He came to do that. He came to do that. It didn't happen, did it? Not because he didn't try. Not because he didn't plant the seed. It's because we are a stubborn people. We are a stubborn people. It says here in the lesson, God's heart was broken. His eyes were filled with tears. For centuries, he reached out to his people as he is today. By their rebellion against his loving kindness, they forfeited his divine protection. 
he allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. He allows you to make a choice. What a loving God we have. And in spite of him allowing us to do that, you know he still waits for us to return? He still waits for us to return. Says Satan delights in war because it stirs the worst passions of the human heart. Down through the centuries, it has been his purpose to deceive and destroy and then blame his evil actions on God. Says down through the centuries, where are we today? What are we seeing today? Churches are sparse, right? People come and go. People bend, some break, but God still waits. But what you need to know is as you study that waiting will one day be no longer. One day. That day is coming. That day is coming. Judgment is coming. Not for us collectively, but individually. So when God calls my name to come before the judgment seat, I can't look back and see whether you guys are here to support me. It won't be about me and you. It'll be about me. And when he opens that book, I am praying that my faith is clean. I hope you do too. Because he has everything that you've done in life written in the book of life. Everything. Yes, dear. Is there really, when you say book, is you're talking how many books? I, I think Revelation speaks of two. I don't know of three. Anybody? Anybody knows? Whether it's two or three? Matthew 24, uh, uh, verses 15 through 20. What instruction did Jesus give his people to save them from the coming destruction of Jerusalem? It was so simple what he said to them. What, did, what instruction did he give them? Don't look back. He said, hand me the mic. And you see in the in the house of them come down again the field of them go back just even go and don't, don't look back don't look don't look back keep going forward what, what is there to gain going back I mean even in our lives today what was there to gain going back looking back of, 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 after as you know my, my my dad used to say all the time uh, uh, baby says what you did yesterday it's gone you can't erase it just go on and go on and go on and go on keep going but keep making it better. Keep doing what's right versus what's wrong. It says, it is well to remember that the vast majority of Christians living in Jerusalem in AD 70 came from a Jewish background. A loving God desired to preserve as many of his people as possible. That is why he gave the instruction that when the Roman army approaches, they were to flee the city. He told them what to do. But we don't have Christ with us today to tell us verbally what to do. But his word, that book that we carry with us, that book that we read, tells you that he is a living God. He's a merciful God. And once you repent, of yesterday, don't look back. Go forward. Stop telling people, well, yesterday I used to, yesterday. We have a bad habit of doing that, don't we? We do. He said, don't look back. Don't, your, your, your life yesterday is not your life today. You know, 
I was told you step out of the old into the new. When you become Christ's child, you are a new creature. You are not that other person anymore. So stop looking back or reaching back to grab that old person. That's what's holding us back. Yes, Elder. You know, uh, this lesson, it contrasts the love of Christ and the selfishness of Satan. Thus, the great controversy. And Satan would have us believe that all of the bad things that happen to us, he wants to blame God for it when he himself is responsible for all of the, the pain and suffering that, that is taking place. But in this particular instance, in Matthew 24, 15 through 20, mm -hmm. Christ is giving a warning to the Christians. Um, when you see these things happening, you should flee. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? The point is God loves us. And he always warns us before things happen so that we can put ourselves in a position not to be so adversely affected. That, that contrasts with Satan. And uh, again, the point is before God allows anything to happen to his people, he gives them a warning. Another, another example is the flood. You know, God could have sent the flood immediately to destroy. Mm -hmm. But in his mercy and grace, <laughs> he allowed 120 years of warning to go mm. when Noah preached to the people. And so God, in his mercy, he knew that there was going to be destruction, but he always wants to save as many people as possible. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. There were always warnings that God gave us nuggets, as they said, that he gave us. He gave Adam and Eve nuggets. Yes. Yes. We see it happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. You know, and so what are we going to do? Are we going to heed the warnings? When the world is, you know, like a friend of mine said, like with the solar eclipse, the world was going after the beast. But it was like we were, some of us were, um, the view of God's handiwork in that solar eclipse mm -hmm. was hidden from some of us because of the clouds. And like I said, it was like that was God's handiwork, but the devil made it, you know, he kind of obscured our view mm -hmm. of that thing. Mm -hmm. And so even with all of this stuff that they're talking about, how many of us are actually heeding the warning that he's given us? And, and the beauty of the book is those of us who do or have or are studying his word stand still. Got to stand firm, that right? Don't let what you hear, what you see, and what is told to you disturb your communications and your knowledge of God, of the truth, right? Because he has told you in the book, in his Bible, that these things that are occurring were to occur. And what he has also informed you is that this is not the last, okay? Know that it is going to get worse. Something my mom and dad said to us when we were little I didn't, couldn't believe it could get worse. I thought it had to get, keep getting better, you know? As you grow up, you expect things to get better. But if they were alive today, I would certainly tell them, you're right. It is worse. It is worse. The word hatred, bigotry, all that stuff is, is, is multiplying, is it not? But we have an advocate who will shield us if we hold firm to what? To his word. Amen. To his word. Okay. So let's look at Monday. Christians providentially preserved. 
I, I thought, I said, now what does he, what does he mean? What does she or whoever wrote this mean by that? Christians providentially preserved. Do you think that? Do you believe that we are? Do you believe that Christians are? Yes. Tell me. Well, just look at history and, and how many attempts have been made to uh, erase Christianity. You know, I mean, time and time again, we, we know, we studied about the dark ages. We know about what, quote unquote, the church did to anybody that went against it, even though it was actually going against the Bible. You know, so it's like God, God wins. He is the winner. And so we have confidence. In, in we hear it said all the time, oh, don't worry about the battle because the war is already won. And that's true because we will survive. Yes. We will survive. The only sure defense we have is our Father. That is our only sure defense. He is our in impenetrable defense. Nothing, Satan cannot deceive God, right? In, any, in the middle of any battle that we are in, God promises that he'd be our defender if we are truly his children, if we are truly covered by the Lord. Come on, my superintendent. Come on. No, no. Come on, Richard. Uh, this, this lesson is so powerful. We need two of us up here. <laughs> Am I right? We need two of us as we keep going through this. You know, there's nothing like God's love. Uh, his, his whole characteristic uh, is about love. And he keeps, um, oh, I'm, I'm getting excited because I'm seeing visitors in here this morning. Oh, I had to stop for a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a new day. <laughs> Hold up now. You know, I got to start all over again. <laughs> I see we have our first lady here today, this morning. Yes, Woo! yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, I got I got a few phone calls this week, uh, Sister Ruin, I guess and, and I said, um, "Listen, what we about is looking forward. Mm -hmm. We're not looking back. Mm -hmm. Everything about God is looking forward. Isn't that right? You see, the devil wants us to look behind. You you know, the most um, frustrating thing is trying to change the past. You have no power to do that. <laughs> it's already history, right?" Uh, but you know what I'm excited about? A lot of my history, God says, if I do the right thing, y'all not going to do nothing about it. It's going in the depths of the sea. I don't know about you. I kind of like that. Isn't that right? Because it's about going forward in God's love. Now, Sister Roy, don't you don't sit down. Don't you sit down. Don't you sit down. Mm -mm. This lesson is too powerful. Too powerful as we put up. I, 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 um, I want to change this a little bit. Hold it. You all see my wife's not here today helping me with my uh, uh, electronics <laughs> and the PowerPoint. And uh, now, let me ask a question. Is anything selfish about love? Huh? Whoops. Come on, I asked a, a provocative question. Huh? If you don't love me, I don't love you back. Hold on. Elder Wenham, we got the, I got the memo. But I got up here, and Elder Wenham got the same towel this morning. You ought to know that. We operate with this, we operate on spirits. Oops, I'm sorry. Turn that back on, brother. Okay. Okay. Go the scripture that says, uh, love seeketh not her own. So that in itself tells you that love is not selfish. And that's just one example of many, many examples in scripture that tells us love is not selfish. Right, love is not selfish. First of all, let me ask, does anybody need a quarterly this morning? Anybody need a quarterly? Come on and help us out here. We have a few quarterlies here. Make sure those get out. I'm going I'm to hold that one for a second as we get, get into the lesson. Love seeketh not her, his own. You know, now, uh, why was Jesus so upset 
when he was looking over the Mount of Olives, when he's standing up on the Mount of Olives looking at that beautiful city. You know, um, apparently Jerusalem was a magnificently beautiful city. You know, the, the temple, it says, you know, was everything uh, emanated around the temple. It just sort of, uh, the, as the sun hit those marbles and things like, we can only imagine how gorgeous Jerusalem was. And when Jesus came and looked at that uh, beautiful city, you know, it's, it's something about um, a perch where you get to see the big picture. Isn't that something? Now, the first time I flew on an airplane as a little young man of 16 years old, it was, ah, oh, I was like, now I see what the birds see, right? Think about how Jesus was there looking at the city of Jerusalem, and he started to weep, huh? He started to weep, didn't he? And it was an amazing thing. Why did he start to weep? Why did Jesus really start to weep, huh? Come on, somebody, let me, let's see this. Sabbath school is, is interactive. Let me see. Who's, who wants to say why he started to weep? You see, because he knew the future. Isn't that right? He knew the future. Now, if you studied the lesson and you understood in, in those times, Jerusalem um, was predominantly made up by the, of Hebrew Jews, originally Hebrew Jews. Now, you know, just think about how we are in, in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas is one of the most, it is the most diverse city in the United States. I'm making a point, okay? Am I right? Every time I get an Uber right now, I can't believe it. Where are you from? Pakistan. Where are you from? India. Where you, where you, where you, you understand what I'm saying? Listen, where are you from? I, somebody told me, I said, where are you from? Albania. I said, whoa. <laughs> so you, you, you have a comment? You have a comment? I mean, this, is, this thing, oh, oh, look here, look here. I'm getting all excited. Here's my former leader here. Elder Sanders, welcome, Elder Sanders. Listen, now you get, give him the mic. Get, it, get over here real close. Hold on. Get, it ready. get, get, the, get the mic to him real close because, you know, he told me everything I know about Sabbath school. I'm going to tell you all that right now. It's your fault. <laughs> oh, listen, now one thing we do in Berea, we believe in having fun. You understand? We believe. Pastor, welcome. Welcome. Woo. You know, uh, we haven't spent a lot of time together, but we know each other, don't we? Huh? From way back. Did you go through my dad's class in Oakwood? No. Oh. <laughs> okay, let me leave that alone, okay? I'm not going to try to be personal, okay? We get with this. But we're talking about the perspective that Jesus had when he looked over Jerusalem and he began to weep. He began to cry because he saw this beautiful city. You know, I can't imagine when, uh, when, if you read Great Controversy as they described how gorgeous that city was. You know, it was something that was magnificent, right? And he looked over there, and you know what he saw? He saw the innocent children being destroyed. Now, I don't know if you understand, uh, World War II was a terrible thing, uh, and six million Jews were destroyed in World War II. But if you look at it relative to what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem, when Jesus looked at it, it said over one million Jewish people were killed. And most of this, unfortunately, with war is innocent children, women and children. And it's no different today. And this is why the devil loves war. Is that right? It says war brings out the basis, uh, terrible uh, passions of the human heart. You know, you know, last week we, just, we, we found out that war started in heaven, which is a, a, a mind blower. Is that right? Even as a kid, I was like, I, I don't understand that. How can that man be standing in the presence of God in, in a vacuum? And, and so you know that was some evil that was deep down inside. Is that right? Deep down inside. But he was created perfect. Uh, I don't want to go back there, but we've taken on to the great controversy in this lesson. When Jesus looked at that city and he cried because he weeped, because, and, and this is a part of this lesson today. Um, can anybody explain to me when somebody's living perfectly, uh, they are literally saints. And, of course, that's a hard to find a saint today. Let's just keep it real. But every now and then, there's a saint. 
and you find out why do good people suffer? Is that come on now? Why do good people suffer? It it actually gets us to question um, the deepest things about our faith from time to time. Personal story. Personal story. When I was 20 years old, I lost my brother and sister in a car accident. My brother was 19. My sister was 17. These are my siblings. I was supposed to be driving the car, but I had tonsillitis, and they were taking my tonsils out, and they were on their way back to Oakwood. My sister, to, to be valedictorian of her class, straight A's, my brother, who had just graduated salutatorian of his class, with a full scholarship to UC Santa Barbara in oceanography in the car. They hugged me at about um, mm, 9 o'clock that night, and by 7 a.m. that morning, I had a call that said that, that there was a car accident, and then before I could even land in Bakersfield, they were dead. Now, I want you to know, this is my personal story this morning. I, pastor, was devastated. I was devastated. And I questioned God. I said, why? I should have been in that car. This is my brother and sister. This thing, uh, it, it is a hole in my heart to this day. My parents were fortunate enough to have 11 children, nine surviving. My mother said, thank God for giving me so many children. But believe you me, Life has never been the same, and I often wonder how different my life would be. Making a point here, I don't want to get off too much, but you understand, at that point in time, I questioned God. I said, God, I don't understand. They didn't do anything wrong. My sister was talking to me. She said, what is it like to be with a man? I said, you're 17 years old, girl, please. You understand? We just spent the night together just talking about life. Life had just started for her. And, but I guess what? I'm excited today. You know why? Because I want to be ready to go meet them. You see, that's the thing. You know, we, joy in the morning. <laughs> that's the thing that we have to, that's why today we are so excited about the future of our Berean church. When I do lead it here this morning, I can't tell you, Pastor, I can't, so happy that you're here. I want you to know that this morning. And uh, so the lesson talks about Jesus. He looked at, can you imagine? Now, the question is, this God who has all the power, he already knows, and he allows this to happen. Anybody have a thought? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Hmm? Hmm? Come on now. Come on. All right, let's give him a mic. Let's hear it. Look, he, he says one word, you gotta, you got to break that down just a little bit. Let's see if you can break that down a little bit to us. I said, we are suffering come to us to prove us. To prove us. Yeah. Mm. For, for example, like Job. And you know what the story of Job. Yes. That Satan said he will cause Job to cause God in the face if God will reach his demand. Right. God allowed him to prove who Job was. Sometimes we go through trial that God will, we have to show who we are. Mm. Mm. God knows who we are, but the rest of the beings, whether in heaven or on earth, don't know what, who we are. But God knows our, our faith and belief, and he knows that going through this thing helps us to prove ourselves mm. that we belong to God. And victory does, you know, Christ gained the victory through death. When he gave the victory for us through death, when he went down to the grave and resurrected, again. And we likewise will gain the victory doing the same thing, following him. He said, take up the cross and follow me. Amen. Suffering um, godly persecution. Sister Roy. You know, when you think of Christ on the cross and you think of the disciples who 
were with him, walking with him, how even they, when some of them died, felt that they were not worthy to die as he did. And why, why, why did he have to go through all of that? Why shouldn't we? Who are we that we shouldn't have those crucif crucibles in our lives? You know, <clears throat> the devil has, um, from the beginning, tried to wipe out Christianity. He's, he, it, this is his whole plan. And he's tried it one way by just straight out war and destruction. Found out that didn't work too good because he created things called martyrs. All right? You know? And it was even more powerful. The martyr is more powerful. Because we as human beings, the human experience is that, man, when a person believes in something so strong that they give their life for it, we all have to admire it, right? No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Is that right? So that has, so the devil said, oh, oops, oops, I got to change my, my tactics. Elder Wyndham, you have a thought? Well, I was just going to respond to your question. You were asking basically, why do bad things happen to good people? And really, if you think about it, the focus of this quarter's lesson answers that question. Why is there evil? The Bible tells us that there is a controversy going on, raging between good and evil. And in last week, we learned how it even began. You know, in heaven, there was a conflict. Uh, but it all boils down to the fact that there's this controversy uh, God created all of us with the power of choice. And so uh, with that freedom of choice comes the potential to choose wrong. <laughs> and when we choose wrong, uh, we see the consequences of our actions. But the, as we go on, the lesson will continue to help us to understand better the nature of this controversy and uh, how it will end. Yes, powerful. If God knew all of this before he created man, well, <clears throat> and he did it anyway, it is an indication of his characteristics. Well, Think about it. Um, Bible 101 taught by my dad was the nature and characteristics of God. God is only restrained by his own character. Is that right? God cannot lie. His character, he cannot lie. You understand? So in the foundation of his character is the foundation of something called love. L-O-V-E. You understand? Uh, it's impossible. And another thing in his character I think is phenomenal. It says infinite. Think about this a minute now. Think about this a minute. Do you realize that a one-way street is not infinite? Amen. Huh? A one-way street's not infinite. It has to have choices. Amen. You see, inherent in his character is infinity, and uh, love and choice is the only thing that can actually, uh, let's say, display the whole business. It's impossible to show love when there's demand. No, it's only choice. Oh, let's think about that now. Whoa. Huh? Come on now. Come on. Look. All right, come on. <laughs> come on. This is, my, this is my Sabbath school. This used to be my Sabbath school superintendent right here, okay? Come on, Elder Sanders. You know, Elder Bill, the, it, it's amazing. Love, uh, the Bible says that love covers a multitude mm, of things. Well, mm. Love always covers, even when you, even in embarrassment, even when you don't understand, because and the Bible also says love is stronger than the grave, Ooh. which means that anything that is dead can be resurrected by love. Mm. Amen. Mm. Anything. That's why when he comes back again, he's going to raise who? The dead, the dead. in Christ. Yeah. Come through that portal. That's I like that word. It says come through that portal. Okay. 
so it just resurrects. That's why I like the prodigal son. It doesn't matter the depth of sin you go to. Love can reach out mm -hmm. when nobody else is reaching mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And to that individual, and they can come to their right mind because love, as the Bible says, if I be lifted up yeah. and I'm love, yeah. I'm going to draw. Yeah. So if you're doing any driving, <laughs> you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Woo. I guess we almost, I got 15 more minutes, but I'm about to try to close on that one. You, you, yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I know I like that, you know, the song uh, uh, that uh, Pastor Maxie was singing. I used to sing that song uh, about the... Uh, uh, you know when the storms of life are raging, yes, and feel like it's fury falling on me, yes. And it goes, I think to myself, why that that is this way. But as the song goes, it says the Lord will make a way somehow. You know, and I thought about it, and I said, well, in actuality. You know, we can, the majority of us can relate to that song, but he's already made a way. Mm, 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 mm. And that way it was Jesus Christ. But not everybody, not all of us can relate to that, that God has already made a way, Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Brother Deacon. <clears throat> let, me, let me give you a thought. I want you to think about this just a little bit. You understand that this great controversy, which we're studying today, has implications that are um, in the total cosmos. This is not just about this world. We are, in the end, privileged to be a part of, um, let's just say, um, displaying the true character of God. We have a, a significant uh, part to play. Why do you think the reward is going to be so great? Huh? The reward says that we're going to be a part of his retinue. You understand? His posses. You know, kings, queens. That, that, look, I'm excited because we, we, it ain't like that down here. Okay? But what I got to look forward to in heaven, it says I'm going to be a king, I'm going to be a priest, and I'm going to be running things. And it says that the greatest, the, your, your most greatest ambitions will be realized in the next life. Huh. Joy, you know, endure sorrow for a reason, okay? Just for a season, but there's joy in the morning. But you see, it says that the angels, the unfallen beings are going to learn about the nature of God through us. How do we get over? How do we get through? Am I right? And I want you to know, ain't, <laughs> I tell somebody, go, I just want to barely get in. There ain't no starless crowns in heaven. You got to bring somebody with you, okay? Not going to be no starless crowns in heaven. And guess what? It won't be no testimony less Pearson. Here's the thing, the great thing about the human experience. We always, all of us have our own story, and it's fascinating, and it's unique to us. That's why God made us all snowflakes, just a little bit unique. You know, one, fit, one size don't fit all, right? God's love covers it all, you see? And it says, and, and, and the devil's a lie. He said, if you let me not have the, uh, just get rid of the rules and we can govern ourselves. Well, rules, freedom without rules is chaos. You understand? In the rules of God is total freedom. Think about that now. And I like to use the example. Can you imagine driving on the freeways of Houston, Texas without any rules? Hello? Now, I moved here. 40-some years ago, and I got scared to death with all the pickups doing 90 miles an hour. I was like, goodness sakes, I've never seen anything like it when I got to Houston, Texas. I was like, they almost driving without rules down here. But anyway, freedom without rules is chaos. In God's infinite love, he says, if you keep my rules, I'm going to give you life, which is freedom, and I'm going to give it to you, not just a little bit, but it says I'm going to give it to you abundantly. You understand? Just trust me. 
Huh? This, this is the reason why it says without faith, it's impossible to please him. Why? Because all of that deep things in the great controversy, we don't quite understand. There's some things that God does. Look, my brother and sister got killed. I'm like, what was that all about? Mm. Right? He says, talk to me later. Uh, let me tell you what. Punch your ticket and make it in so that I can talk to you. You know why? Number one reason is because right now you're not ready and you're only looking through the glass dimly. You understand? You understand we only know in part right now. It says we only know in part, right? So he's got to take and get our minds perfectly together because guess what? We're going to be understanding it forever. Now, that's something that's hard to, to deal with because everything we know is the beginning and the end. Oh, I had a birthday last week. Y'all know I had a birthday last week, okay? <laughs> Whew. I got, you know, I'm excited, but now I'm like, I don't know how much time went by so fast. I don't even know. We're, we're not even going there. And, there's, and then there's the end. And then somebody says, well, El Bill, you got born, but the only thing certain is, is death. Well, That's not exciting, right? Taxes and death. Where's the other one? Okay, the other one. You know, it's tax season, right? Taxes and death. But guess what? I'm looking for the other side where it says that I'm going to live forever, yeah. right? That's, that's what God has got. That's got, got that's right. I'm going to live forever. That's huh? Listen, let me tell you something. It's amazing right now. Because, see, I'm, a, I'm one of the baby boomers, all right? So all we're doing now, everybody in the baby boomer, a lot of y'all in the same category, we're trying to find ways that we can live longer, have better health, you know, all that kind of stuff right now. Am I right? Huh? Listen, I'm in denial. You, I'm in denial. I, I, I got to tell people I got dysmorphia. Of course, I was blessed and married a, a young wife, so I wake up thinking I'm the same age she is. All right? That's it. But see... Only in God. Now, I don't want to get carried away. All right, so that'll be it. Let me read this to you. Let me read this to you. <laughs> I see Elder Sanders laughing at me. Okay. That's it all says, right. That's all right. Let me read this to you. It's important. It said, the mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in faith. Huh? Perplexed. It says, it's going to take faith. Some things don't question, right? Don't be, you know, see, see, here's what the devil did. Think about what the devil did. The devil created this, hmm, wait a minute now, wait a minute. If you know and you're sure that you know you know, are you going to say, hmm? Think about what I'm saying. What did the devil do? It created a question in God's perfect creation whether he was right. Created a question. Okay? In life, it says it's important that you are not uh, blown by every wind huh? that comes by. You know, there's certain things you just got to make up your mind and say, listen, guess what, devil? That, you can't get me on that one. Okay? You, I'm sorry, you better try somebody else because I know, I know that he died for me. Well, I, know, I know that he rose. Okay? That he rose for me and that it's all set now. It's all set. And he says, I'm not interested in sacrifices. I'm interested in obedience. No. I'm not interested in sacrifices. He says, I'm interested in obedience. If, if you love me, keep my commandments. Huh? Isn't that what he says? And so uh, we are uh, an example to the whole cosmos. Do you realize that God rolls it back in there that the unfallen beings are, are looking with, with great, wow, it, it's some drama going on down here. Okay? You know what? We, we look at Netflix and all that stuff, but can you imagine what the universe is looking at down there with this drama that's going on down here and say, wow, and they're getting an understanding of God's love. I can't imagine, Pastor, what they thought when they saw God of heaven come down and make himself a little a vulnerable baby. Start off as a baby. And, you, and, and they got to see the devil poking at him as a baby. Do you understand? He started poking at him as a baby. Can you imagine how he poked at him as he was growing up? Poked at him. And then they saw him go all the way to the cross and kill him. They actually saw. And the God of heaven, all powerful and everything, reduced himself to that level to save us. And it gave the whole universe an idea of his character, which is the foundation of love. That means, you know what love is? When you go do something 
that you don't have to because you you know, you own it. You are the sovereign. You made the rules. And you say, guess what? Let me show you. I made the rules, but even I am subject to my own characteristic rules. Because you see, you know, we get used to people got well, um, we got privileges. You know, I I'm, don't I'm, I'm get into politics. I want to get into politics. Somebody think they're above the law and all that kind of stuff. And don't, it's not subject to them. All right? We won't get in that today. Okay? But God says that that's not the way I am. I came not to destroy the law, but to magnify it. Well, it to magnify it. And he says, and I do it by doing this. Not talking about it, but being about it. Is that right? About being about it. So we're going to, you know, uh, we're, we're coming to the close. We got five minutes. Where's, uh, where's my first elder? Everything else. We got five minutes. Sister Rowan, you have any thoughts? Hmm? As we kind of wrap up this lesson today uh, on the great controversies, um, this, this is a, a phenomenal lesson. It's a book uh, that I've read. And the thing about God's word is so exciting is every time you read it, it's new revelations because it's alive. You see, it's alive. No, it's not the historical data. God's words are alive. You know, when you read a book, it's usually about somebody's thoughts, right? Or, or the history of something. Well, this is the history, but the book is alive because it has power in those words. Yes, Elder Wyndham, please. Uh, Elder Wyndham, yes, Elder Wyndham, yes. You know, one of the interesting things about this lesson to me, you know, earlier you asked, why do bad things happen to good people? And one of the aspects of this lesson was the, the persecution that the Christians suffered because of their beliefs. They chose to be on the side of Christ. But the interesting thing is, it seems like the more the church was persecuted, the more it grew. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, the, the lesson talked about how, how the church was, was able to make inroads into some of the uh, far than most part of the world. They said places where eagles could only go. Yeah, The lesson yeah. said the only place where the eagles go was. It's amazing. A and the enemy on the other side of the controversy is no fool. He said, the more we persecute, the more this church grows. So he shifted his strategy from one of persecution to encourage compromise. Mm. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. You know, we, we asked, why do bad things happen to good people? Um, well. You know, it, it's hard for some people to grasp. But it's interesting that amidst that persecution, the church grew. And now that we don't see as much persecution, yeah. how has that mm. impacted us? You know, mm. just something to think about. Mm. Something to think about. <clears throat> I have a yeah. saying uh, uh, that compromise. Uh, how, how many of y'all heard of white lies and pink lies? I just want to know, how many, you know, do you know a lie is a lie is a lie? Huh? Sometimes we rationalize. Well, that was just a white lie because I really didn't want to hurt somebody's feeling. Guess what? Bust hell wide open for a white lie. He says, a lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Okay? So, compromise. Listen, we got to call sin by his right name. Okay? It just be... It, it, Thus saith the Lord. Because in compromise is danger. There's danger in it. Because guess what? Imperceptibly we slip into sin. Imperce just a little bit at a time. Think about that now. That's what it's saying right there. Pastor, you have a thought? You have a thought? No? Oh, oh yes. I, I know we're probably getting ready to close the lesson, but my sister back, your sister Black, yes. she asked a question yes. earlier I'm, yes. about if there were three books and Sister Ruin said there were two, so we're just trying to make sure that her question was answered. Okay, she said Sabbath ask about three groups. books, all right? Yes. I'm going to pass that on to pass that on to the pastor to talk about the three <laughs> books. No, no, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we got the authority in here now. <laughs> you, you got it, Elder. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't a part of here of the question, so I need to understand the, the context. I need to understand the context. What was the context of the three books? It, what was the question? Help me with the context. You mean that we talk about? I'm yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I, I, thank I you was so told much. Told that it was three books, and that's why I'm questioning. How is it? How many? You mean books book, of the Bible? Of the Bible. Uh, book of deeds. Book, book of life. 
Oh, in judgment. When the books were open, there were three books. Okay. All right. So, hey, I'm going to hand that to Elder Sanders. Hold on, I'm asking, they, they, listen, they, they can't I, ask I, questions I, now. I, I think we can ask. I'm trying to figure got, out what that was in my Sabbath school we, lesson we, today, but that's okay. We got some Bible I, I don't want, listen, yeah. let me tell you one thing. If I don't know that pr exactly, I'm not going to be fooling around with it. You understand? I'm going to say, let's go back, and i tell you what. Let's go back, and next Sabbath, on Sabbath school, I'm going to have the answer for you, because I'm going to get my research done on those books. Now, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to go into stuff thinking. Because we're talking about God's, we're talking about soul salvation. You don't go thinking, you need to know. There you go, a scripture. I have a scripture to back it up on those three books. Anybody just have a thought about that? I'm going to come back. Now I got to go back. Now you're going to make me go back and do some digging. You better, I need you here at 10 o'clock in the morning because the first thing we'll do is answer that. We're going to answer that question right there about the different books. I, I have an idea. I do. I have an idea. But I want to go back and, and lay scripture onto you because it's not my idea that counts. It's God's word that counts, okay? You know? And listen, Pastor, when you get up there, I'm going to have my Bible open. <laughs> I told the last pastor, I said, I'm on your side till, till you bring some heresy up in here. <laughs> but you, you, we know that's not your reputation, so we don't even have to worry about that. Thus saith the Lord. So I'm on your side. So I'm, listen, I'm going to have the book, the verse, and we're going to go to it. That's going to be the first thing, Elder Wyndham, <laughs> Sister Ruin. We're going to answer that question. I want to talk about all those books right. in Revelation. <laughs> Let me tell you one thing. I'm gonna, here's, I'm going to give you one last thing. Only thing the, the book I'm concerned about is my name being in that book of life. Okay, so I'm going to end with that one, but we'll come back to those three books. All right? So at this time... Um, Elder Wyndham, can you, would you offer closing prayer for us as we uh, enjoy the... How, how many people enjoyed our, our Sabbath school lesson this morning? Amen. Praise God. Amen. And, um, Amen. God I've is good. I've got one quarterly left. Anybody don't have, does not have a Sabbath school quarterly, all right, brother, I'll get this one to you. Get this one to you. Elder Amen. Wyndham, will you close Amen. us out? Thank you so much. All right. I want to thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Sister Roy Ruin, for starting us off and Elder Beal for a spirited discussion. At this time, let us pray uh, as we close out Sabbath school and segue into our divine worship hour. So we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the blessings of this, your holy Sabbath day. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word, uh, to ask questions, to learn, to, to, to grasp your love for man. Uh, Father, as we continue to study throughout this quarter this great controversy, may we grow into a deeper knowledge and appreciation of you and for how you want to save your people. Now, Father, on this special day, as we prepare to segue into the 11 o'clock hour, we ask, Lord, that your spirit would continue to dwell in this place. May all that is said and done glorify your holy name. This we pray, and this we thank you for, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.
morning, church. Let us stand this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning, as we enter into your presence, we're so grateful for this opportunity to worship and serve you this day. Lord, as this is a special day, a day that we welcome our new, our new pastor and his wife. Lord, may you bless this, bless this meeting. May you bless this convocation. May you bless the songs that will be sung. May you bless the words that will be spoken and the prayers that will be prayed. In Jesus' name, we do humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Let us repeat the fourth commandment that is found in Exodus, tw the 20th chapter, verses 8 through 11. And the Bible reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and thy work, but the Sabbath day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Welcome to 
Welcome to Berean Church. I pray that you are blessed today. And we're welcoming the Holy Spirit in our midst. Amen. There's a sweet anointing in the sanctuary this morning. says God called Abraham his friend. How many really want to be a
So welcome to Berean, everyone, this morning. I pray you're having a blessed Sabbath. Amen? Amen. So here at Berean, what we do, we welcome each other, we walk around, we say hello, and we hug, and we shake hands. So Berean, you know what to do. Let's go. Dismiss the children's for children's church, but before they go, I want to remind everybody. But there will be Pathfinder. Um, there will be Pathfinder this afternoon, after lunch. We'll have the Pathfinder meeting, and we will be having prayer meeting or lesson study on Wednesday here at Berean at 7 p.m. In person, Berean. In person at 7 p.m. this coming Wednesday. So at this time, the children will go up for Children's Church. Miss.
do I go when there's nobody else to turn to? Who do I turn to when nobody wants to listen? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know he's able. I go to the rock. I go to the rock of my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain, and the mountain stands by me. When the world all around me is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. Where do I hide? Till the storms have passed over, who do I run to? When the winds of sorrow threaten, is there a refuge in the time? of tribulation when my soul needs consolation I go to the rock I go to the rock of my salvation I go to the stone that the builders rejected I run to the mountain and the mountain sends my feet when the earth all around me is sinking sand on Christ the solid rock I stand When I need a shelter, when I need a friend I go to the rock I go to the rock of my salvation I go to the stone that the builders rejected I run to the mountains And the mountains, they stand by me Is sinking sand on Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hallelujah. We have Jesus in the house. Did you open your house and say, Jesus, welcome to the house? So he's here with us. He's a rock of our salvation. The Bible says, I look unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. He's the God and he's God only. Amen. So I hope you have received some... Um, the prayer request cards so you can write your prayer request and our elders have the prayer boxes and we're going to put our prayer request so we do it intentionally in Berea and SBA church we write our prayers down intentionally and we tell God here is our request and we know that you are able to do abundantly above all that we can even ask or imagine he say test and see how good God is that's how you taste how good God is by writing down and being intentional. Amen? Amen. So we're going to read from the book of, um, of Matthew. Matthew 11, verse 28. This Bible this week has been my rock. And it reminds us this morning as I read, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What are you bringing to the house of God this morning that you are burdening, you are carrying those burdens with? Are you carrying the burden of finances? Are you carrying the burden of sickness? Are you carrying the burden of pain? Are you, which kind of burden are you carrying? Are you, are you being tested? You know you have to be tested as a Christian. You have to be tested to grow. Those tests that you are carrying this morning, those afflictions that you're carrying this morning, he said, come unto me, all you are that labor and heavy laden, and take my yoke. He says, my yoke is easy. I want you to imagine. I need you to imagine this morning. I need you to put in your imagination. There are two oxen, and they're yoked uh, on, uh, behind their neck, and they are pulling and, and, and tilling the land. One of the oxen is Jesus himself. And the other oxen is you, my friend. You are tilling and pulling that burden. But don't pull it alone. Let Jesus pull with you. That's why he said my yoke is easy. So we have to be yoked with him. When you're yoked together with Jesus and you pull that yoke, as you're pulling that yoke on that land and you're tilling and you're pulling those burdens, you're producing. Say I'm from producing. I am producing in the mighty name of Jesus. So this morning you're producing. Don't worry about those burdens. Just give it and get yoked to Jesus this morning. Amen? Get yoked to Jesus this morning. Before I pray for the prayer request, as we are writing our prayer request down and putting it into the boxes, our choir, our praise and worship is going to help us sing a song in Jesus' name. Everybody settle down when there is prayer in the house of God. We have to set our hearts and our mind in Christ Jesus. Where our help comes from is our help. He's our present help in time of need. He's our present strength. Our strength and our hope comes from Him, the maker of heaven and earth. So thank you so much.
So let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come in this place, O God. Let your kingdom come in our hearts, O God. Father God, we surrender ourselves this morning unto you, O God, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith, O God. We ask for forgiveness wherever we have gone short of your glory, O God. And we ask God that you may cleanse our hearts, cleanse our minds, cleanse our hands, cleanse our feet, O God. Cleanse our hearts, cleanse our church, cleanse every pew in the name of Jesus. And we ask God and we open our hearts this day, O God, and we receive you, O God. We receive your power this morning. We receive your love this morning. We receive a sound mind this morning, oh God. And by Father, we are connected to you this morning in the name of Jesus. And we ask God that anybody who has walked into this sanctuary, oh God, I pray, Father, my God, that you will set our hearts. Yeah, my Father, in a receiving mode, oh God, that we receive from you, my God, blessing like never before, God. And we receive our pastor, my God, Pastor Williams, oh God. My Father, my God, we surrender him and his wife into the throne of mercy this morning, oh God. I pray, my God, Jehovah, King of glory, for a blessing upon them, anointing, fresh anointing upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you for every member of this church, oh God. I pray, God, Jehovah, that you may help us, oh God. Help us to align ourselves with your word, oh God. Help us to align ourselves with your spirit, oh God. So may your will be done in this place like never before in the mighty name of Jesus. So I thank you for our children, oh God. I cover our children in the blood of Jesus as they study your word this morning, oh God. I pray that you may give them wisdom, oh God. I pray for every revelation of your word be upon their hearts, O oh God. I pray, Jehovah, my Father, for their homes, O oh God. I pray, Jehovah, that may be with them, O oh God, and guide our children, O oh God. May your spirit be upon our children in the mighty name of Jesus. So I thank you for this service. I thank you for every prayer request. And I pray, my Father, anybody among us who is sick, oh God, we pray healing over them in the mighty name of Jesus. By your strife, we are healed in Jesus' name. Every pain that we ask that is be gone in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray healing in the mighty name of Jesus from the roots in the mighty name of Jesus. So I thank you this morning and I lift you up, oh God. So be with us, oh God. Guide us, oh God. Lead us in the way that we should go, oh God. And we surrender ourselves to you again, oh God. Knowing that, my Father, you are God and you are God alone in Jesus' mighty name. We pray and we thank you. Amen. and happy Sabbath to you. My name is Dr. Carlton Bird, and I'm privileged to serve as the president of the Southwest Region Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. 
I regret that I cannot be with you today, but I had to share this video message with you. First of all, I would like to thank you, the Berean Church family, for your support to Dr. and Mrs. Robert Norwood as they shared in ministry at the Berean Church. We praise God for the ministry of Dr. and Mrs. Norwood, and we thank Dr. and Mrs. Norwood for their ministry at the Berean Church. Today, we begin a new chapter, and we welcome Pastor and Mrs. Gilbert Williams. Pastor and Mrs. Williams, God bless you. Now, Berean, Pastor Williams is excited about what God is going to do through the ministry of the Berean Church and his ministry as together you work to build the kingdom of God. In fact, he has shared with me exciting plans, exciting ideas, and I'm excited because men, women, boys, and girls are going to be drawn closer to the foot of the cross. Thank you, Berean Church family, in advance for your prayerful support to Pastor and Mrs. Williams. Pastor Williams, we're praying for you. Preach the word. Shepherd God's people. Tell a dying world that Jesus saves. And I'm confident that you're going to do just that. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. As we look across our globe, we recognize signs all around us foretell this. Let's be ready. Let's go out and get all excited and tell everyone that Jesus Christ is King. Until I see you real soon, may God continue to bless you. May God be with you. May God bless Pastor and Mrs. Gilbert and Gwen Williams. And may God bless the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today is an exciting day. Amen. In fact, in the Bible, whenever they had a ceremonial Sabbath on a regular seventh day Sabbath, they called it a high day. Amen. This is a high day because you have you are going to be receiving the pastor and the first lady to shepherd you unto the kingdom of God. I had an opportunity to introduce a pastor last week in Baytown. And what I'm about to do is unheard of. <laughs> simply because it shows the testament and the love of Pastor Williams. It also shows you the kind of pastor you're receiving. I want the Baytown Church to stand. I want you to come out of hiding. Remain standing. Remain standing. Pastor Williams. Pastor Williams. Pastor Williams. This is unheard of. This is a testament to your love, to your ministry, to the power of God that you have poured into these members. They have permission from the pastor. I heard it myself. He told them that Highway 225, Beltway 8, and what's the other one? I-10 would be open this week only. So I just wanted to share with you Berean. Let me send a warning to you, Berean. You don't see this. I've introduced a lot of pastors in churches. You don't see this. And this simply says that if you don't want him, yeah. 
In fact, someone told me, we've come to take him back. And I said, not on my watch. <laughs> you may be seated. As I said, this is a high day. I've been in ministry 40 years. I have never, ever seen this. This is the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. The Lord said, I will send pastors after my own heart. And you know, in the Sabbath school lesson, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Here's a pastor that has poured his life into ministry. I want you to read with me the accomplishments. And I'm going to take the time to read it all because you will get a synopsis. You will receive a window into the heart of Pastor Gilbert Williams and his lovely wife. Amen. Amen. Pastor Gilbert Williams is a graduate of Oakwood University with dual degrees, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology and an Associate of Science degree in Communications. He is also a graduate of Andrews Theological Seminary in Barron Springs, Michigan, where he earned the Master's in Pastoral Ministry degree. Pastor Williams has been involved in other special assignments throughout his ministry between churches and Southwest Region Conference. He considers himself as a lifetime pastor and church administrator. Amen. He has been a church builder and a people builder wherever he has served. He has taken a little and made a lot for the expansion of the kingdom of God. He has served in the Southwest Region Conference for 39 years of pastoral leadership in the states of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. Pastor Williams has constructed and renovated churches and baptized over 700 people. He has been a faithful servant encouraging God's people. He has helped develop the gifts of over 50 local elders throughout his ministry in Southwest Region Conference. He organized and built a new church facility in Palestine, Texas. He built a new gymnasium and educational complex in Texarkana, Texas. He is strongly committed to Adventist Christian education. He built and completed the new church sanctuary for Smyrna Seventh-day Adventist Church in Houston, where he served for 12 years, as well as the Hebron Church. He also organized the Smyrna Spirit Spanish SDA church as one of the churches in his district. In addition, Pastor Williams' recent accomplishment includes over 150 baptisms, 32 transfers, and two professional faiths at Baytown United Seventh-day Adventist Church where he served for eight years. Additionally, he led over 30 church upgrade projects to enhance the overall church campus and raised over 50 k 50,000 for a special project. His wife trained over 40 leaders and helped them to become master guides through her leadership. This is a complete team. <laughs> Pastor Gilbert Williams is happily married to the former Gwendolyn Sykes of Louisville, Georgia, Louisville, Georgia, for 39 years. Praise God. 39 years. They are proud parents of three children. I do not want to attempt to say these names. I may get them right if I don't correct me. Gabrielle, is it Galen and Gilbert Levin? The second, they have one grandson, Braxton Williams, and two granddaughters. Yes, yes, okay. And Brooklyn Williams, Gwendolyn currently teaches at the Aldine Independent School District in Houston. 
Pastor William strongly believes that everyone must find their purpose in God's church. He believes that we have been called to shine the light of Christ through our spiritual gifts. He believes that you must bloom where you are planted. He strongly believes in salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus as the central message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want you to put your hands together to receive Pastor Williams and his lovely wife, Gwendolyn. You should come, please. Yes, yes, yes. That'll be a go ahead. Go ahead, play, sir. Yeah. It is now time. See, it was always a celebration in the Bible whenever they received the priests of God. And God would welcome them with the Shekinah glory. Oh, if we had the Shekinah glory today. It would be the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. You would see God moving. The day we see God moving in his people through the power of the Holy Ghost. You have heard of him. It's the paraclete. You do know about him. The paraclete is the one that walks alongside of you. He digs in beside you. He is the one that converts us and prepares us for the kingdom of God. You have heard about him. The paraclete, the Holy Ghost. Sister Chariot prayed a powerful prayer, inviting the Holy Ghost to come. You see, your pastor can only rise as high as your prayers. So if you have a problem with your pastor, it may be because you're not praying. Because if you pray him up, he goes into the stratosphere and he receives revelation from God. And when the power goes up, when the prayers go up, the power comes down. And it hoovers because God will give this church what they need in order to be successful in these living, these, de these, these dying days. What we need is a fresh glimpse of the kingdom of God. And once we get a glimpse, then the power will come in just like the day on Pentecost. Oh, I'm looking for that day. I'm looking for that day. And if it's advertised at Berean, you will see me here. I want the elders to come forth now. The elders of this church. All elders. I need all my deaconess to come and deacons. I need you to come and join your pastor and first lady. This is not going to be an ordinary day because this is God's day. And if you are an officer of the church other than the ones I called, I need you to stand. If you hold a position in this church, did I get all the positions? I guess I got all the positions. Just in case. Oh, there's one there. Okay. Ushers. Yes, there you go. Ushers. I need my ushers. The gatekeepers. We have a litany here that we're going to read. And then I am going to anoint this couple. And then we're going to pray. 
And then we're going to have special music. And then we're going to hear from the man of God. Let me see those who have this. Do you have it in your hands? Okay, this is what I'm going to be reading from. I'm excited about what God is going to do. I'm just like Pastor Bird. When Elder Williams shared with him the things that was on his heart. Amen. You have already seen the testament of his ministry. Over half the church has come down to see this anointing. Amen. God is doing some strange things in these last days and I'm glad to be a part of it as I read Holy Father on this blessed Sabbath day we acknowledge you as the sovereign God of the universe and humbly respect humbly request your divine presence in this sacred service today Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, and fill us with your spirit. Make us one in you, dear Lord, and overshadow us with your glory. Lord, we lift up to you today, Pastor Gilbert and Gwendolyn Williams. May they be precious in your sight. Endow them with power from on high. God has caused his face to shine upon us. Congregation. Pastor Gilbert, we rejoice and ask you as a part of this family to open our hearts to you, to invite you to lead us in our daily walk with God. My delight is in the Lord, and I pray that together we may grow in his grace. Pastor Gilbert. God has given to you this charge of leading these, his people, in their preparation for the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abide in him, and you shall bring forth much fruit. I accept the charge to present the living Christ through my life and ministry, and I pledge to always exalt the name of Jesus. We covenant before God and each other this day to place Christ first, to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and to work together for the hastening of our Lord's soon return. You have heard the acceptance. And at this time, we are going to anoint your pastor and first lady and then we're going to pray. Amen. We would ask that you join along with us in this activity. Amen. I need all my officers to come around, lay hands on each other, elders, lay hands on the pastor and the wife, and everybody else touch somebody. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ and the Holy Father who gave his only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit whom Jesus sent as the Comforter who would lead us and guide us into all truth. Father, we thank you for this manservant we thank you for his wife of 39 years. We know that you are a miracle worker. We know that you are a healer. We know that you are a creator. We pray, Lord, that you will create in Gilbert and Gwendolyn a heart like your own. As they serve, Lord, may the Shekinah glory flow from them. 
Lord, when people come into their presence, may they be healed. When they come into this sanctuary to hear the word of God, may chains fall off. Lord, we pray that you will let him down in the wellsprings of your knowledge. And Lord, that you will give him words that will break the yokes off of the backs of sinners. Oh, Lord, we know that you're going to do this. We know that you have done it in the past. He's not a stranger to your grace. He's not a stranger to your power. Nor is he a stranger to your blessings. So, Lord, we pray that you will open up the, 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 the house. And pour him out. Seed. We pray for the elders, Lord, that they will join around him, that they will hold him up, that they will lift him up, that they will pray him up. And we know when prayers go up, the power comes down. We pray for the deacons and the deacons and, and all the ushers and, and even the members, Lord. We pray that as they receive the word, they will be excited about going out to bring somebody else to Berean to hear the word of God. Because they will hear, they will say that sinners get saved here. People are restored here. People are healed here. People receive their sight here. The blind receive their sight and the dumb talk and the crippled walk. The same thing that happened in Jesus' day. Oh, it's a new day, Lord. But you promised. You said that these things would happen. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give Pastor Gilbert and Gwendolyn a double portion of your spirit, just like Elijah asked for. And Father, we also want to pray this prayer according to what Moses said. If you are pleased with me, and you teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you, Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Give him your rest, Lord. And may he remember, don't worry when you're doing your best and no one thanks you, just preach. Don't be discouraged if success seems to elude you. Just preach. Don't wait for others to get on board to get the job done. Just preach. Don't waste time on trivial matters that rob you of your energy. Just preach. Don't harbor bitterness towards anyone because they didn't agree with you. Just preach. Don't believe that something is impossible because you don't see how. Just Mercy. preach. Don't offer excuses when you serve a God like ours. Just preach. Never forget, you are God's man and God's woman in God's place, doing God's work for God's purpose in God's way, to God's glory, to God comes. So preach, preacher. Preach, preach, preach until you draw your last breath. Preach, preach. Brothers and sisters, I present to you your first family, Pastor and Mrs. Gilbert Williams. Hallelujah. Hear ye them. Amen.
bless God today for the praise singers. Come on, church. They, they have set the tone for our worship along with all of our instrumentalists. Let's give them a, a hand clap. Thank you. Let's see, brother. I know brother Lorise Rose. We go back. Good to see you there. Um, Elder Sublimi. I'm going to work on the names in a little while. All right. God bless you. Is that stone? Stone on the stone, right? Brother Stone. Good to see you today. God bless you. And that's, uh, is that Jeremy? That's Kristen. All right. We're get, I'm going to get it right. All right. We bless his name. Come on, let's give them a round of applause again. They have done so marvelous on today. Um, I'm already messed up. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it right by next Sabbath. But I just want to take this time to thank first and foremost. I want to thank the Lord. I want to give God, who is the center of my life, the joy of my salvation, give him praise and honor and glory for uh, this new chapter uh, in our lives. I want to give him praise for, for what he has done. I also want to, um, want to thank Elder Charles Sanders who came to install me on today. Elder Sanders is a friend of mine, and he is a warrior for Jesus. He and his lovely wife, Marlene, they're very close friends of ours. So thank you, Elder Sanders, for your words uh, on today and the prayers that have been uh, prayed. I also want to take this time before I get into the word to thank uh, your predecessor, Dr. Robert Norwood. Come on, church, let's, let's show some, a lot of love. I want, I want everybody to stand up for my good friend, Dr. Robert Norwood, who served this church for almost six years I did a tremendous job. Everybody stand up. Let's give the, the former pastor of this church a round of applause. We bless the name for Dr. Norwood and his wife, uh, Sister Norwood, as they prepare to transition to San Antonio, Texas. Let's keep my good friend uh, in prayer. Um, my conference president, Dr. Carlton P. Byrd. We bless God for our president and for his leadership. And I would not be here uh, without the confidence uh, in the administration. Uh, Elder Jason North, our secretary, our uh, treasurer, El Elder Philip Palmer, and all of the members, all of the members of the Southwest Region Conference Executive Committee. Uh, bless God for them and uh, their insight and foresight that God led them to uh, bring me to uh, Berean, Seventh day, Houston, Berean, Seventh day Adventist Church. Am I right about it? I want to make sure I get it right. Amen. Now, uh, I need to say a big thank you again to, it's already been said, to the Baytown United Seventh-day Adventist Church family. You guys have, whew, wow. Y'all, y'all something else. Thank you so much for your love. Uh, uh, Pastor Samuel is a good friend of mine uh, and his wife, Rhonda as they take over the uh, Baytown United Church ministry, give them our continued prayers. And I know Baytown United, you, you are going to support your new pastor 
as you supported Gwendolyn and I. We love you so much. You, you just don't know you, my heart. I have two hearts here today. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I don't know which one is thumping the hardest right now. But we bless God for you. All right, I'm here. Berean, Berean, Berean. All right. All right. I have a new wife today. I wore a white suit. Because you know, when you get married, you should have on a white suit. I have my primary wife, but I have a secondary wife today. I need all of Berean to stand up. Berean Knights, where are you? All right. God bless you. God bless you. All right. All right. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. Huh? Come on here, Elder First Elder. Elder Kelly, help us out. Who's missing? Uh, everyone is in the overflow, Pastor, in the fellowship hall, so okay. that all Baytown can be comfortable. Amen. <laughs> All right, thank you. I was about, I was, I was, I was getting a little worried here for a minute. <laughs> all right, so so all of all of the Berean Knights who are uh, in in the uh, fellowship hall, overflow, different areas of the church, we bless God for you. Let's let's give our Berean family, come on, church, a round of applause. We bless God as we launch out with you today. Amen. Amen. All right, my sister is here today, Janet. Stand up, Janet. Amen. All right, that's my sister. She's from Southwest Houston. And, uh, oh, my niece. Stand up, Jasmine. All right, got to recognize them. They're here today. God bless you today. And, of course, uh, you know my, did my children stand up yet? Okay, Gabriel, you better stand up, girl. Stand up, baby girl. All right, she's here. Uh, she's the firstborn. And uh, she has a beautiful voice for Jesus. Um, and then uh, we saw Braxton. I think he's in the back with the kids. Uh, we bless God for them. Uh, Galen is not here today. Uh, Galen, uh, she's at home with our newest granddaughter, Brooklyn. So we ask you to keep Galen in prayer, and our son, Gilbert II, uh, he told me he's going to try to get over here sometime today, and so uh, we praise God. My family, the Burrow family, they're here today, all the way from Dallas. Stand up, the Burrow family. All right. I pastor the Burrow family all from Texarkana. Now they're in Dallas, and we bless God for uh, the Burrow family and what they have meant to us as well. As I'm looking around, um, you know, Gwen and I, we served here in Houston for 12 years. And so we have members that we have pastored over at the Hebron Church and Smyrna Church. Anyone I've pastored in those districts, those churches, will you kindly stand today, my Houston friends? All of my Houstonians, come on now. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Hallelujah. They are in the house today to see their formal pastor. We bless God for you. Amen? All right, all right. I believe I've covered everything except for the, the jewel of my wife. You've already seen how she's still beautiful. She's still, and she's still, she's still standing with me. And so uh, she is, she is my vitamin. She is my vitamin. She's, she's everything. And honey, I love you. And I'm going to need you in this season. Amen. Let's give the first lady a round of applause, everybody. We bless God for her today. Amen. Amen. We're going to get into the word of the Lord now. Amen. We're going to get into God's word today and so we can go and get something to eat because I like to eat. And it is 1230. But before we eat, we're going to eat some word today. I need to say a big thing. Stand up, Elder Kelly. Stand up. 
Elder Kelly, I mentioned he's the first elder of this church, and he has been a guide to me during our transition, and he's a hard-working head elder. And Elder Kelly, I want to thank you so much. Looking forward to working with you. We'll need your prayers. Amen. God bless you. Uh, Brian, we're going to have prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And I need your face in the place where once again we will experience God's amazing grace. But, but I'm going to be here now. If it's only me or my wife, we're we going we to have church. And you say, well, why, Pastor? We could just do this thing online. You know, here's the thing. You know, I, I, you know, I like online, but it's not the same. We need to touch and agree. I can't touch you online. We need to touch and agree because there's some work that needs to be done right here in Third Ward. Greater Third Ward. We're in the heart of Houston. We've got a work to do. And we're going to start praying and praying for this community, praying that God will move in a mighty way. Uh, Elder Kelly, every fourth Wednesday night, you got that? Fourth Wednesday night, that's going to be youth night. Write it down. I want young for every fourth Wednesday night, that's going to be young people night. I, let's get them out here, and the young people, a young folk, I want the youth to invite your friends to youth night, and I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the young people. You get, you get them to preach, teach, find the preacher, find, if you don't have, I'll be your last resort, but that is, that, that will be their night for the rest of the year, Every, so they got one, what, two weeks from now, young, what night is, what, what will it be called, Stone? Night. All right. And, and my wife told me we're going to have some refreshments. Amen? All right. She told me we're going to have refreshments. So come on out Wednesday night. This first Wednesday night, we just want to spend some time praying. Amen? I need you praying for the pastor. Praying for Berean. Amen? Praying for Third Ward. Amen? Let's come together and have an evening of prayer for the ministry of this church. Prayer is the key to heaven. Faith unlocks the door. Somebody said little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Much prayer, much power. So we've got to get in line and begin to pray. Like never before, God wants to do a new thing here at the Berean Church. This is the mother church of among Seventh-day Adventist churches in Houston, Texas. I said, this is, I, th the Lord brought me over to mama. Mother has given birth to other churches. This is the mother church. Over 100 years old, I am told. Come on. And I say to God be the glory. And I told my conference president last night, I said, this is a special, special church that you've called me to serve for such a time. And I'm, by the way, I am humbled to be here. I don't deserve to be here. I'm humbled to be here. And I'm wanting God to do a great work in the years ahead. Not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. We can't do anything without the Holy Spirit, saints. And so I want to encourage those of you who have, maybe you have kind of, you know, gotten a little slack in your journey. We're not here to, to, to judge you. I wish I had a praying church. Boy, we're here to love on you. If you don't have a church family, that uh, come to Berean. Hmm? Is that all right? Yeah, come to Berean. Give us an opportunity to pour into your life. Let's begin a, a new journey together. 
And bring your family and your friends and your relatives. Berean Nights, I want everybody, I'm giving you a charge. We're going, going to get to the word. I want to charge everyone in Berean to invite someone to church. Pray that God will put somebody on your heart. It could be a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker. Because you never know, that person that you bring to the house of the Lord may very well give their life to Christ. I heard somebody say, there will be no starless crowns in heaven. So I want to encourage you to, to, to reach out and let's make a difference in our community. Let us all look to the Lord. Let us stand as we look to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today that you have brought us together in this sacred place, your church. It is a house of prayer for all people. God, I pray today, I declare unto you today, Lord, that you would bless your people. Bless your people in their coming in and bless them in their going out. Pray, dear God, that you would move mightily among us in this season. Lord, we need you more so now than we've ever needed you before. So, God, as I take on this new assignment, I realize that I can't do this alone. So, Lord, I'm asking that you would guide me every step of the way. I've seen what you have done in the past in Baytown, Texas, as well as in North Houston, Texas. But you have called me to the Berean Church, and I believe that you are ready to do greater in this new season. Oh, Lord, this is your church. Oh, God, these are your people. Somebody here is hurting, Father. Somebody has been, has been wounded and attacked by the enemy. Somebody here has come with heavy burdens. Somebody here, Lord, has lost a loved one. Someone here today, Lord, is they're at the end of their ropes and they don't know where to go next. Oh, God, I pray that you will step into these unique situations that you would work it out in your own way and in your own time. So God, we bless your name today. Bless your word today. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Amen and amen. As you're turning to the book of Jeremiah today, I do want to express publicly my condolences to the Wyndham family, Elder Michael Wyndham lost his dearly beloved mother uh, over the past several days. Many of you have heard. Let's remember Elder Michael Wyndham and family in prayer. The Lord will strengthen them in this season. Also, we lost at the uh, Hebron Church uh, the late Sister Myrtle Beasley. And we will be having her life celebration service tomorrow at the Hebron Church at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And so let's remember these families. Let the church say amen. God will bring comfort in their hour of grief. Um, as we go to Jeremiah, I want to talk to you today. It's uh, 20 minutes to 1. Bear with me. Uh, embracing the call of God, embracing the call of, 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 of God. Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, if you'd be so kind to stand uh, for a moment. Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 1, uh, trying to get over here. Jeremiah 1, commencing at verse 5 of the book of Jeremiah. If you have it, say Amen. 
Jeremiah chapter 1, commencing at verse number 5, 5 through 10. The word of the Lord says, Before I form thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Verse 9 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Altogether, verse number 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root, root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You know, when the Lord called me to come to Berean a few weeks ago, before I received the call, Elder Sanders, I was thinking about winding things down. I said I was thinking about it. You know, I've been in the battle for 39 years. And so the thought crossed my mind. Maybe it's time to wind things down. And then the Lord said to me, uh, seemed like in the middle of the night, he says, he said, Gilbert, don't wind things down. Rev it up. And I kept, when I heard the Lord say that to me, I actually you know, because I, I got a piece of paper and I actually wrote it down on a sheet of paper. Don't wind things down. Rev it up. And I couldn't get that thing out of my mind. I said, Lord, are you sure you're telling me something here that it, there must be something you're trying to get over to? God is saying, I'm not through with you yet. It's not time. There's still a work that must be done. You see, sometimes if you're not too careful, you can find yourselves in a comfort zone. And when you get in that comfort zone, you say to yourself, I'm just going to take it easy. I'm just going to do the basics. I'm in this comfort zone. I'm going to just ride it out. But God was saying to me, it's not time to get in the comfort zone. There in Baytown, Texas, if that's your plan, then I'm going to move you so you can rev things back up. Zelda Williams, I'm ready to wind it down. God says, you got to rev it up. I'm reminded of there in Napoleonville, Louisiana, many years ago, around in my teenage years, 
I, I had this fixation for sports cars. And I remember uh, during my high school year, Stone, he's gone now, that um, I, saw a, 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 I saw this firebird, chocolate brown firebird. And I prayed and I prayed for that car. I was broke. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. I was in high school. And I would walk by that new car dealership praying to God. Because everybody says, you know, they say, you know, the they, they, they always say, ask and it shall be given to you. So I said, well, I'm going to test the verse. I'm going to keep asking, and God's going to give me that car. But you know, I didn't get that car. I didn't get that car. And so oh, uh, one, of my, one of my friends, uh, his name was, his nickname was Mule. Some of you all have some Mule friends. Mule came across an old white car. It looked like it was like in this... In the, in the late to early 60s. And Mew came around with that old car. And uh, he, had, he had done something to the engine. He had done some things to the muffler. And uh, he, said, he said, Gilbert, let's go for a ride. I, I, you, 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 you're going to enjoy this one. I said, man, that's an old car. You know, you need to do something with that. But he had done, he had put work into the engine. And when, when Mule would hit the, the press, the accelerator, that old car would say, rah, 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 rah. And man, I would be, I said, whoa, Mule, let's go for a ride. And when, when Mule would, when, when he would press down on that accelerator, the, 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 the front engine of the car would just lift. And we went on down the road back there home, on the home front. It was called Ellum Hall Road. It was just a straight road that take you from the, uh, from the one, one, one part, uh, one uh, back end of the country to, to, to the other end of the country road. And that old car would just get up and, and roar and lift. And you could feel the power of that, that car. It, was, it had an old body, but it had a powerful engine. You see, some of us in the church, we have an old body. But God says, I can do some tweaking. Uh, I can do a little tune-up on you. And I can, I can get you to a place uh, where you can begin to rev up and get your engine to lift up. And, and let me tell somebody here today, I don't care how old you are. When you give your life to God, he can, he can restore you and empower you. And if you're not careful, you do more for God in your golden years than you did in your younger years. I, 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 my help is coming. Somebody must be praying for the preacher this morning. I'm beginning to feel something up in here. God has a calling over your life. Embracing the call of God. God's calling and his timing is not always what we expect. And I need to tell somebody that today. A Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran pastor and theologian, uh, he said, the responsible person seeks to make his or whole life or his whole life a response to the call of God. The responsible person seeks to make his whole life a response to the call of God. In other words, my friends, we, uh, we begin with the call of Jeremiah, a man who clearly gave his life to fulfilling the call of God. 
You know, my friends, I've discovered in life that God is often unpredictable. It doesn't matter, though, even though God is unpredictable, it doesn't matter. Just be thrilled that he called you and that he loves you and that he has a purpose uh, in your life, a purpose for each life that's seated here today. You have a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets, even as Michelangelo painted, or, uh, or Beethoven played music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. Uh, he should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. And we could add he did it for the glory of God. And so the book of Jeremiah, uh, it is the story of how Israel has persisted in rebelling against the will of God. And God sending a prophet, uh, Jeremiah, to confront them and foretell their destruction at the hands of the Babylonians and an impending period of exile. And in the story, we see something of the challenges that Jeremiah faced as an unpopular bearer of bad news and his struggle to persevere despite the cost to him personally. In other words, that Jeremiah, uh, he was called, his call came uh, during a time of challenge. His call came even during a time of chaos. Sometimes God calls us in times of challenge. I wish I had a praying church here uh, today. Uh, and I want to offer a disclaimer before I really go deep into this. There are times in life that after having given something our best shot, we have to give up or surrender to the inevitable. Ron Hansen, in a book that he wrote entitled The Exiles, Ron, he recreates the story of five nuns who were traveling to the, to the United States on a German ship called the Dutchland. And in 1875, this ship was launched on its maiden voyage with these five nuns aboard. The ship was caught in a blizzard, and it ran aground soon after it was underway. And unfortunately, the five nuns that were on this ship, uh, they all perished in the shipwreck. And so Hansen's book not only tells their story, but also the parallel story of, of Gerald of Manley Hopkins writing of his famous 35 stanza poem memorializing this particular disaster. And at some point, all the striving in the world could not save this particular German ship. At some point, all who survived had to leave the sinking ship. So my thoughts today are not about knowing when to bail out of a plane that is about to crash or when to get in the lifeboat when a ship is sinking. It is about being resilient. It is about persevering through all of the challenges of life. You have to sometimes be willing just to persevere. It is about uh, having grit. 
Uh, it is about a digging in and giving life your best shot. It is about playing until the whistle blows. We have, my friends, we have to be willing uh, to end endure the, the, the road uh, even when it gets rocky sometimes. And sometimes in life the hills are hard to climb. And sometimes even in church, life uh, can be hard. Oh, mighty quiet in the house. You feel like giving up on the church. You feel like giving up on prayer. You feel like uh, uh, giving up even on your service to others because you've been hit so hard. Life will throw everything at you, whether you are in the church or out of the church. And so Jeremiah was thrust, when God called him, he was thrust into this kind of scenario. And so, my friends, uh, when you're going uh, through these challenges in, in your life, uh, all you can do is keep your eyes on Jesus. That in a crisis, you have to keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. I need to tell one or two believers here today, stop looking at people in the church. Yeah, no, you you, you got to remember that. Church folks will church folks will mess you up. Yeah, yeah, you 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 have to you know we mean well. But 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 we will often fail you even in the church. God never told you to look at somebody in, your, in the church and make them your criteria for being saved. As a matter of fact, do not even look at the pastor. Don't make him your criteria. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. And I need to say one or two individuals today that, 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 that man did not bring me in the church and I'm not going to let a man drive me out of the church. God called me, and God called me into his church, and I believe that he has the power to keep me in the fellowship. Stop letting folks get on your last nerves. Talking about, I'm tired of this. And you never gonna see me ever again. You just gave you just gave Satan a praise break. Stop giving Satan a praise break, where he can he can upset you so easily. You tell that devil you a lie. Get thee behind me, Satan. I don't belong to the devil. I belong to Jesus. And I'm going to stay in this race until the Lord says to me, well done. In the game of life, when life looks and feels hopeless, you must ask yourself sometimes, what do you do? What do you do when you feel like giving up? The first thing you do is that you've got to revisit your calling. Somebody say, revisit your calling. Jeremiah 1, as we said, de 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 declares in the text, the word of the Lord came to me saying to Jeremiah, before I form you in the womb. I want you to think about that for a second. The text says that. The prophet said, God declared this to the prophet, before I form you in the womb, I knew you. That's heavy. I, I, when I read that again this week, I was like, man, I said, wait a minute. I, I actually had to pause on that. I said, wait a minute. I've read this a lot. I've read this many, for many years. But God said, 
to Jeremiah, before I even form you, I already knew you. That's, that's deep. That is powerful. He says, he says, he says, before you were born, watch this, before you were born, I set you apart. Think about that for a moment. In other words, he says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And then he says, do not be afraid, for I am with you and will rescue you. And so in this passage, we see certain uh, 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 truths that, that, that should help us today. The first truth is that God knew us before we were born. God assured Jeremiah at the very onset that his arrival on the human scene did not surprise God. God says that he knows us before we are even formed in the womb. In other words, God knows our pre-embryonic forms or cells. More than that, God told Jeremiah that he not only knew him before he was formed, but that he, God, formed, formed Jeremiah in his mother's womb. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. And so whenever anyone is tempted to, to, to devalue or denigrate or dismiss oneself as insignificant and without value or purpose, God wants that person to know that they were known by God before they were and, and, and that they are a product of God's creative activity God says, before I form you, I knew you. The second truth is that God also sets us apart or called us or gave us a purpose in life before we were born. God knew that I was going to be at the Berean church before I was born. God knew I was going to be at Baytown United before I was born. And he also knew how long he was going to keep me there. Because one thing I've noticed about, one thing I know about, know about God, he is precise. He is particular. God is precise. He makes no mistakes. He's in charge of this world. And so everything that happens, it's, it's, uh, there, there, there is sovereign activity at work. And so God said, there are things that I have designed for your life and my life, I, uh, they were designed before you were even born. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Psalms 139, 15 and 16 says, My frame, my frame was not hidden from you. And uh, when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's another book. In other words, my friends, God not, God not only knew and created Jeremiah, God also gave Jeremiah a purpose for living. God appointed him the role of prophet. The word appointed may be understood as a calling or being set apart for a purpose or as a consecration. The point that God made with Jeremiah is that his existence is meaningful and purposeful. I stopped by to say to one or two believers here today that you are not an accident. You have 
purpose in this world. You have you, your, your existence and my existence, it is meaningful to this world. God makes no mistakes. You've been set apart. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God wanted Jeremiah to know, and God wants us to know that we exist, exist to function in a specific way in order to accomplish what God has planned for us to do. God says, I knew you, I formed you, and I set you apart with purpose in life. So when we are tempted to give up, sometimes this world throws so much at us, we just want to throw in the towel. Am I right about it? I just stopped by to say to one or two believers here today, we need to revisit our call. And hear God say once again, I have appointed you. I have set you apart. I have have consecrated you to live purposefully. And the struggles of life do not negate the reason for our existence. The third truth, my friends, is that God having called us, watch this, God having called us intends to accompany us on our journey. That should help somebody here today. This is what God said to Joshua uh, when he called him to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. He said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Uh, Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 9. In other words, my friends, no matter how complex, uh, chaotic, or confusing your circumstances may be, God will not abandon you. God will give you all you need in order to persevere until the very end. He's going to get you through this thing. He's going to get you through it, through hell and high water. Oh, yes, he will. He got you. There is a verse in the Bible that speaks about the promise of his presence. Because God says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And when you, when you, when you really put that verse under uh, 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 a microscope. Uh, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. you. You need to understand that what God was really saying to the insightful reader is this. No, I will not never leave you. No, I will not never forsake you. You may run from him. but he keeps his eyes on you. God says, I'm not going to leave you. Somebody, you know, some, some, listen, what time is it? Oh, Lord. I got to close down and I haven't even started. Listen, some of you, some of you have, you have, some of you have mamas praying for you. You got, you got daddies praying over you. You, you, you have, you have your grand parents praying over your life. There are people that they are, they are weeping between the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Lord help us. They're weeping between the porch and the altar for the salvation of their children. You got parents that are laboring they are literally burning out there. They got calluses on their knees 
praying for you. And you're talking about, well, I don't care. I do what I want to do. There's a God in heaven, my friends. He's been merciful. Even in your foolishness, even in your rebelliousness, he has covered your sorry soul. Oh, yes, he has. And you know you're sorry. You're sorry. But God has been merciful to you. He has kept you from seen and unseen dangers because the mama's been praying for you. Oh, I'm trying to finish this sermon. I'm trying to finish it. So, my friends, we've got to revisit our calling. God knew me before I was, I was and, and, and informed me as I am. God called me to this place and this time for a purpose even before I was born. God will never, 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 never leave me. My wife might leave me. She better not think about it. But God says, I will never leave you. God says, I got your back. I got to close this thing down. I'm so messed up already today. The second thing you can do when you feel like giving up. You know, when you feel like, can I, can I, can I talk a little bit, just a little bit more? I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm getting out of your way. The second thing you can do when you feel like giving up is simply be honest with God. We've heard it said, honesty is the best what? Just be honest. Be transparent with God. Tell God how you feel. Tell God that you're not feeling Him. Just be honest with God. God, can, God will deal with you as you're open and honest with Him. Tell him about your hurts. Tell him about your pain. Tell him why you are so upset. If I had some time, if I had a little more time today, I would tell you about Jeremiah. Jeremiah even got to a place after God called him. He said, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, and over there in verse 14, uh, Jeremiah, he, he's being transparent and honest with God. He said, God, you deceived me. And I was deceived. First of all, what nerve do you have to talk to God like that? I mean, you taking a chance, brother, to just say anything to God in prayer like that. This man falls on his knees and he says, God, you deceived me. Now, you can tell me that. But talking to God like that, elder, come on now. And then he says, I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. Cursed by the day. He says, cursed by the day I was born. You see, God had asked Jeremiah to do a rather unusual thing. But Jeremiah was to visit a local potter, purchase a clay pot, and then in a public setting, smash the jar and say, this is what God is going to do to this nation and to this city. God is going to smash you beyond repair. Sometimes, my friends, we're so frustrated in this life. and We feel like we can't find God. But I need to tell somebody that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. It may be impossible with man, but nothing is impossible with God. As the pianists play, I'm going to shut this down uh, because uh, it's time to eat. But Bereen, I have, just as God placed his calling on Jeremiah, I just stopped by to say to one or two believers here today that God has a calling on, on your life. 
This call is not just a call for this prophet. I am not the only person called to this church today. Everyone, every person in this church has a calling on their life. I've got to do my work and you've got to do your work. Members, you have a work. Every one of you have an assignment. Elder Hawkins, God has a calling for your life. And we've got to revisit that calling. And nothing is too hard for the Lord as the pianist plays. So, my friends, God is calling you. God is getting everything in alignment. Somebody say alignment. Because I believe that Jesus is coming again soon. And he's calling us to finish the work because he's coming back again soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. This past Monday, millions of people were looking toward the heavens, looking toward the solar eclipse. And I was reading the reports, they say, some of the writers said that some 50 million people, 30 million people were in what's called the totality zone, where they can get the full view of this solar eclipse that comes around every 20 years. And you had another 150 million people outside of the totality zone. So roughly 180 million people were within the zone of seeing either a full eclipse or a partial eclipse. Scientists say that the way this thing works, the earth revolves around the sun and the moon revolves around the earth. And this is what leads to what we call eclipses. You have the sun, you have the earth, and then you have the moon. And while all these revelation, revolutions are occurring with these celestial bodies, God steps in and he lines everything up. You missed what I just said. You see, I believe, I'm closing, these revolutions are precisely ordered by the God of the universe. I believe celestial bodies are bound by the orderly laws of God. And the reality is that these scientists will not admit that the God that we serve is a God of order. He's a God of precision. And so they're getting into the totality zone to catch a, a full view of this eclipse. I remember reading in the Bible that one day as Jesus was getting ready to ascend into heaven, and somebody said, why stand ye gazing up into the heavens? That this same Jesus, which is taken up to go up into heaven, he's going to come back again someday. You see, I stopped by to say to one or two believers here today that it's time for the church to get into the totality zone with Jesus. See, 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 because the scientists do not want to tell you that they're focusing on the solar eclipse. But there is something that's going to happen that will be greater than the solar eclipse. 
Jesus is coming again. But you and I, we've got to get into totality with Jesus. We got to get prayed up. We got to get church up. We got to get into the Word. We got to get some revival going. We got to get some stuff out of our lives. We got to get into the totality zone so that we can experience the fullness of our God. Because he that shall come, will come, and shall not tarry. And I just stopped by to say to somebody today that if you're not in the totality zone with Jesus, get in that totality zone. Because I believe that our Lord is coming back. And he has called you like he called Jeremiah. He's called you and you and you. He's called me to, to, to reach out to other people and bring them into that. we got to bring them into totality zone. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Amen, amen. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. What a word. What a word. So we say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Baytown. Taking good care of him. And reminding us that it's not time to wind down. But I was born to rev it up for God, Amen. To rev it up for God. So God, we, we just thank you again for uh, being with us and, and serving with us. And we thank God for this pastor. So come on, Berean, we can show some love. We thank God. <laughs> for the anointing that is on his life. And uh, we have some presentations that we want to make. We know that the deaconess, I'm going to give them opportunity now. I would give my, my wife, my, she stepped out already. Yes. Before he does that, Elder, if you could just play a little something. If there's someone here today, you've come. You just want to have a closer walk with Jesus. Would you just stand? I don't know who you are. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. Just stand up. Say, I want to have a closer walk with Jesus. I want to be in that totality zone. I want to be ready when Jesus comes again for me. Maybe you have been doing things apart from Christ. God is calling you to himself. God bless you today. I'm going to ask Pastor Sanders if you just come and just pray a prayer. Because I believe the Lord is coming back. We got we to gotta get connected, Elder. This is, these are serious times. And I'm not here to play church. I'm not here to play church. I'm serious about kingdom building. Let's bring someone. Let's get them connected to Christ. Elder prayer prayer today. Loving Father in heaven. Indeed, we are grateful for the word that has been spoken. You have challenged us. You have taught us that we are made in your image. You're made for a purpose. You have lined us up, Lord, so that we can be saved. And even right now, Lord, as we look down through the times, we recognize that you're soon to come. As we take an introspection of our own lives, we recognize that we need you to get things in order for us. Just like the eclipse, we recognize that when we look into the wonderful eyes and face of Jesus, that everything we have disappears. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. But when we take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ 
and he sees his righteousness, then we are your children. So, Lord, as we pray, we pray that we will believe that you will save us. As we pray for our children, we know that you will save them. As we pray for one another, we know that you will hear our prayer. And this church, Lord, as they continue to pray, they, we know that you will answer the prayer. And so, Father, we want to thank you in advance for the miracles that will go forth in this church. We want to thank you in advance for the revelations that will come forth out of this church. We want to thank you in advance, Lord, for all the blessings that will come from this church. And Lord, we pray that we will be found in that number. And that everyone that have taken a stand today, Lord, may they hear the voice of God. And may they follow the voice of God. Because we know that he will save us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen. may be seated. At this time, we want our deacons to get in position. We want to lift this morning's tithe and offering. We want to lift this morning's tithe and offering. And once we say our prayer for the tithe and offering, we'll make our presentations to Pastor Gilbert Williams and his lovely wife. And then we'll have our pastor to give us our benediction. And uh, I'm going to say uh, just again, thank you again for your faithfulness, Berean. And uh, I'm going to stop talking and let them play their music. As we thank God for the gifts that he so richly bestowed upon us. Malachi 3, 8 through 11 reads, Will a man rob God? Yet have you robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. And pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 12, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let us bow as we thank the Lord for his many blessings. 
Lord God, we come right now saying thank you, thank you, thank you for this morning's tithes and offering, God. We thank you for those who uh, gave, those who had the desire to give but have not. God, we ask a special blessing on each of their lives. God, we pray that these funds, uh, these gifts, God, be used to the edifying of your kingdom. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we want to make some special presentations uh, to our First Lady, uh, Sister Gwendolyn Williams, and as well as our pastor. I want y'all to come on down up front right quick because we want to say thank you. We have our deaconess are coming. They have some something special for you. We want them to come on, and I'll let you say some words once again. Hello. I wanted to read you this card from the Deaconess, and it says, Sister Williams, the Houston Berean Deaconess wholeheartedly welcome you to your new church home. Yes. Yes. We acknowledge your service and sacrifice as a pastor's wife and pray for you as you surrender to this calling. We look forward to sharing this journey with you, your sisters in Christ. Amen. And we have this fruit arrangement for you. And here's the card. And we got a little something for you, too. <laughs> And here's the card. So, Pastor and Sister Williams, we have heard and we have seen over the years your dedication to the young people in the church, and in particular, the adventurers. Yes. And so, on behalf of Sister Anna Monday, she's our adventurer leader, and our adventurer staff, we have a small token a gift of love for both of you. Now, there's something in there, so you want to make sure you take care of that, okay? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, so, you much. so much. Thank you. And I have one last thing we want to give to our pastor. Come on, pastor. These are your keys, man. <laughs> keys to the church, to his office, to the post office box. Man, take these keys, man. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh, and my wife, come on front, come up so we can have, we want to give these flowers uh, on behalf of our church family. These flowers are being presented to you and your lovely wife. I don't want to miss that. And so you got your hands full now. So we're going to take this edible arrangement. I promise I'm not going to eat any. And you can take the flowers. Thank you. And so uh, at this time, love on your first family. We so thank God so much for all of us and all the gifts, all the thoughts. And so uh, I just want to say we just want to bloom where we're planted. We thank you all so much for the heart of love. And uh, we're not perfect, but because Jesus loves us, we will always do our best. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say to all of those who came to to show your love to us today, we thank you. But Sister Cumberbatch, flowers. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> all right, you may be seated. Uh, Pastor, at this time, you can give us uh, the blessing of for the food. We're going to go ahead and let you bless the food right now. And... Uh, our benediction. Now, our children have been released from Children's Church. They are in the fellowship hall, so we're going to transition. I know our ushers, we're going to exit this door, and we're going to make sure that uh, every child knows where his mama is, all right? And so at this time, Pastor. Let us all stand at this time. Uh, once again, thank you so much all of our friends and family members, Berean Knights, for coming. Amen. God bless you. Let us, I want you to just reach around and um, touch somebody. Um, I'm going to ask also our, all of our 
officers, and come on down front. Let's just um, connect all of our officers. If you would come down front and let us um, bring closure to our service here today. Amen. All of the elders and officers, if you would come up. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder. All right. Is everyone up here? Praise the Lord. All right. Praise the Lord. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Loving Lord, our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again for your tender love and your constant watch care over us. We ask your blessings upon the entire leadership team of the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we also pray, Lord, for all of our uh, members and friends from various churches in the community, that you would bless them in their respective leadership roles. We look forward, dear Lord, to that day when you will return and that you would usher us all into your heavenly kingdom without the loss of one. I pray this prayer, asking, Lord, also your blessings on the food that we are about to receive. May it give nourishment uh, to each and every person on this day. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. At this time, you may be seated. You're going to be now in the hands of our ushers, and we'll direct everyone through this door to the fellowship hall if you want to stay by to fellowship with us. Mm -hmm. 